Hello, this is Todd Locke, and this is a review of Power Pack Outlaw Number 1 by Marvel Comics. So, this is part of the Outlaw crossover, which involves some of their younger superheroes, and it spins off of Champions, which I don't follow, so I'm not really that into the crossover. I'm not really familiar with it. But what I am here for is that it is written by Ryan North, who is the writer of Squirrel Girl. And if you've never read Squirrel Girl, I highly recommend it. It is brilliant. It's heartfelt. It's original. It's like nothing you've ever read. It's just, it's just a funny, wonderful series. Um, but that's over. So now Ryan North is writing this Power Pack miniseries. And so first I'm going to do a review just based on the issue itself. And then I'm going to look at the history of Power Pack. And we're going to see how that issue fits in. So let's start with this cover. Um, I, I, it's just kind of okay as a cover. Um, I mean, it looks like a convention sketch, to be honest with you. You know, there's no background. There's nothing going on other than just the characters flying, or in this case, Katie is uh, using her powers. Um, it's a nice convention sketch. I would be happy to own it if, uh, you know, if I went to a convention uh, and ask for one, but as a comic cover, I just, you know, I don't think this sells the uninitiated, you know, the characters are just kind of flying around, they look kind of generic, uh, Julie here looks way too happy, um, and then we've got Jack down here, and his power is to become a cloud, but it's drawn kind of strangely, so it looks like instead of a cloud, he's becoming like the gas that comes off of dry ice, <laughs> Um, it, it's it's not the greatest rendering of these characters ever, though I do love uh, the drawing of Katie here. She looks really cool, you know, creating this spark of light. Um, and one thing I do want to point out before we get going, I just want you to look at Julie here. So her power is she flies so fast she leaves this trail of light that looks like a rainbow behind her. And notice that her feet and her legs kind of blend into the red here. So keep that in mind. And also take a look at her hair color. Take a look at it. And remember, this is what Joy looks like. So the issue begins with this crudely drawn recap of the origin by Katie, who is the youngest member. Um, and this is a very interesting choice to begin the issue. And I'll go into that when we go into the history uh, in a little bit. But... After this, we finally get to see what our characters look like. And this is supposed to be Julie from the cover. Um, doesn't look a darn thing like the girl on the cover. So that's a little disorienting, even if you're new. Um, but take a look at the this artwork. Um, I think this page sort of sums up how I feel about the art in this book. We got backgrounds, which is great. Uh, I like the fact that this artist does storytelling. He does backgrounds. Uh, it's his rendering that is kind of hit and miss. Um, I like the way he renders Katie. I like this throughout the issue. He does Katie, who is the youngest member and is the focal point of this issue, uh, well. It's the others that I have a problem with that, you know, I just don't like the way that they're rendered. They don't look particularly pleasant. I mean, I do appreciate that he does try to give them some fashion sense. They're not just in generic t-shirts, but the artwork just isn't particularly pleasing on the other characters. And, you know, it, when we get into the historic context and see how Power Pack's been done in the past, this is particularly head-scratching choice for an artist. But again, Katie looks great, and the storytelling in a, a lot of the just normal at-home scenes is just really good. But it's the action scenes where the artwork just suffers. I mean, Julie does this weird-looking thing where she poses like a flying squirrel when she flies, and it just looks really awkward. Um, Jack turns into... He's supposed to be turning into a cloud, but... I, I'm not sure, quite sure what's going on. There's a trail of clouds, but he's also just this like blue guy. I mean, he's turned like blue and it just looks really weird. Um, and then 
you know, another problem is, you know, when we get far away, we can't tell what's going on. I think this is supposed to be Alex and Katie um, back here, but it's kind of hard to make out. And again, it just kind of looks weird, you know, especially, again, the flying squirrel stuff with Julie just looks weird. And notice that her legs don't blend into the light that she gives off when she flies. Um, he's not the only artist to do this. I definitely prefer it if the artist does have the legs blend in, and I'll show you what that looks like um, in more detail later. But yeah, I mean, I feel like these giant panels are just kind of lost on this art style. Um, the, just the layout of the action just isn't there for me. And by the way, I pointed this out in my review of the last Ultraman issue for Marvel, but they have started going with some super thin cover stock, th thinner than the interior pages, and it's just super easy to, you know, accidentally wrinkle and get fingerprints on and stuff. So just be careful about that if when you're handling your comic books for Marvel now. And I feel like the coloring's a little weird, too. I mean, the cloud that Jack gives off is shown as being blue, and I'm not sure why that is, but it, it just looks really weird. It looks doesn't look like a cloud. It looks like pollution. So let's talk about the story. So it's told through Katie's point of view. Uh, she's the youngest, and so she's, you know, the most naive and the most, uh, you know, has that youthful energy about her. And, you know, if I had to pick a character that I liked out of, the, out of this bunch, I'm not a Power Pack fan, but I would probably pick Katie as my favorite because, you know, she's got the most iconic pigtails in comics, and arguably she's the most powerful and uh, just, you know, her age, you know, kind of makes her a really fun character. So I think it was a great um, call to tell it from her point of view. Um, we, of course, tell the origin, and then we kind of get into kind of establishing the characters and their relationship with each other and their parents. And so there's conversation about, like, should we tell our parents about our powers? And then, of course, they eat dinner with their parents and end up uh, hearing about a supervillain attack in the middle of dinner and they have to figure out a way to go and deal with that without their parents realizing that they're going to deal with that and it's a wonderful little con job that they pull the dinner scene is definitely the highlight of the issue to me and definitely brian north at his best um, once we get to the villain fight it's a villain named the boogeyman who is a uh, villain from their series. Uh, they give a little bit, they give just enough to, to intrigue and confuse you, but not enough that we have any idea who he is, really. Um, but it really, he's really there as a catalyst to kind of set up them getting arrested at the end uh, because they broke Kamala's law. Um, for underage vigilantism. But I felt like, you know, I would have still liked to have known more about the Boogeyman. There seemed to be a history there uh, that might have made things more interesting. Uh, instead, North tries to play up the fact that, you know, he's annoyed that he's not able to eat orphans. <laughs> he's, trying to, he's trying to break into an orphanage so he can eat the orphans. He's annoyed that the cops are, are, are delaying him his feast of orphans, you know, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But it is kind of weird because I don't know if orphanages still exist in America. I mean, if kids are taken into state custody, they're typically um, placed with foster parents. But it is the Marvel Universe, and it is a different kind of reality. So I guess there are orphanages in America in the Marvel Universe, and there are also cops that will pull out a SWAT team um, on a first offense to arrest children. Um, it's ridiculous, but obviously this is the way things are dealt with in the Marvel Universe. We saw very similar things in Civil War. It's just a convention of the superhero genre and Marvel Comics in general. So, you know, it's dumb, but, you know, obviously this is what Ryan North was handed. And it does tie into and a miniseries called Outlaw that he is not writing. So obviously Ryan North is kind of constrained by the things that have been given to him. Um, but overall, his writing is very solid, uh, at times really great um, in this 
issue. Um, sometimes the dialogue does kind of slip into Squirrel Girl territory. And, you know, the dialogue in Squirrel Girl is very distinctive to that book and to those characters. And it just felt really awkward hearing it occasionally come out of the mouth of Julie or another character. Uh, but for the most part, the dialogue is spot on. It was just occasionally, you know, you had a little thing like that that would take you out of it. Now, the issue is probably not going to, you know, sell the uninitiated, I wouldn't think. I mean, it's solid, the writing is, but, you know, when I combine it with the art and just the fact that this is set up, I really can't tell you where this is going, what's going to happen to them now that they've been arrested. I don't know. Um, I just basically get kind of a setup for the characters, um, and since... I like Ryan North. I'm getting the next issue, right? But um, I just don't know if it's really enough to sell someone who doesn't know what a power pack is, especially when I combine it with the art that just didn't really mesh well with this particular issue. And so let's talk about the history of power pack a little bit and, you know, the context of this first issue. Um, so this is the actual original power pack first issue. I don't have the physical one but this is uh, something off Comixology. And so it was created by Louise Simonson and June Brigman. And so a lot of us know Louise, uh, also known as Wheezy, as a writer, but she actually was an editor at the time. And so Power Pack was the first series she actually wrote for Marvel. And so she got an artist who also had never drawn a comic, named June Brigman, but June was a good portrait artist, and so they felt like that would help, uh, considering that the Marvel art style at the time was very realistic, and that, you know, she would have to draw all these children of different ages, because the idea was that they were, you know, these preteen superheroes, and that was very different at the time, because you know, we'd all, always seen, you know, adults and teenagers, but never preteens. So it was definitely a, a challenging book to draw. But I would say Brigman, uh, this is still from the first issue, really knocked it out of the ballpark. And she only got better as time went on. Brigman went on to do a lot of work for the 99 by Teshkill comics. Uh, this is now a defunct series that she did a lot of promotional art for. She did newspaper strips and she also uh, did the later issues of this series, which are available online on Comixology. And incidentally, the only original comic book art I own is from Brigman. And this is a page from the 99 because uh, the 99 stuff is pretty cheap because no one wants it. But it is just so gorgeous. And she actually came back uh, with Louise Simonson to do an issue of Power Pack last year called Power Pack Grow Up. And it looks gorgeous gorgeous. I wish I'd known about it just so I could get it for the artwork. Uh, and by the way, Louis Simonson, if that name sounds familiar to you, uh, you know, she went on to write a lot of stuff, most notably X Factor, where she created a little villain named Apocalypse that you might have heard of. So a really proud legacy from the two women that created uh, Power Pack. Eventually, other creative teams would take over the original Power Pack title, but it did find its audience and lasted more than 60 issues. And its artwork, you know, like I showed you, is based on that, you know, kind of realistic Marvel style of the time. And when it was canceled, you know, Power Pack went away for quite a few years. And then about 2005, somewhere around there, Marvel brought it back as part of their Marvel Age line for kids. And the artwork is a lot more cartoony, but the covers are gorgeous, and the artwork on the inside is is good. Um, you know, as long as you don't mind a cartoony art style. Uh, this is by David Williams, um, who, like I said, does really gorgeous covers. But most of the Marvel Age Power Pack is drawn by Gory Hero. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, but it's a studio in Japan that does this gorgeous animated style art for Marvel Comics. 
And this studio would go on to do some absolutely stunning work for uh, Marvel and Gwenpool. And this version of Power Pack, the Marvel Age version, they actually lasted over 40 issues. They do them in these mini series that would be four issues a piece, but they did about, I think about 11 or 12 of them. So there's a good bit of, of stuff to get there if you're interested. Again, I you know, the, our, the story's okay. It's really kiddie down stuff, uh, unlike the original series that was written, you know, within the Marvel Universe and, you know, kind of grounded in the real world. But the stories here... Um, are still fun, and the artwork is just gorgeous. And by the way, the first Marvel Age Power Pack miniseries actually began with Katie drawing a comic of their origin, just like the new series. And strangely enough, the Marvel Age version of Katie is a much better artist. And so that strong artistic legacy of having some of the best realistic artwork and some of the best animated style artwork out there you know, kind of made me disappointed that I opened it up and saw an art style that was neither that I just, I don't understand why they thought this was a good idea to put on the book. And some of these characters had very distinctive looks like Julie, so I was kind of disappointed that I couldn't recognize her when I opened up the new comic. And I was also disappointed in the portrayal of the powers. Here's Jack in his cloud form, which, you know, looks like a cloud. And different artists have had different ways of doing it over the years with Jack's cloud form, but it still looks cloud-like no matter what. And this is one another one of those gorgeous Marvel Age covers. And this is June Brigman layouts, by the way. So this is this style of drawing Julie where her body blends in with the light beam that it creates. And here's a more recent example. This is uh, from Jonathan Hickman's run on Fantastic Four, drawn by the great Nick Dragota. And again, you know, Julie's legs blend in with the rainbow. But obviously different artists have drawn it with her legs not blending in with the rainbow. But you'll notice that it's natural posing that looks like she is flying. And it just looks a lot better than Julie the flying squirrel here. And so let's talk about the story context here. Um, so originally they were done realistically, you know, in the original series and then the Marvel Ages series which doesn't really tie into real Marvel continuity you know did it in a more cartoony way and this kind of you know strikes a balance between the two but the curious thing is the way that the characters age so according to Wikipedia and if Wikipedia is wrong this whole segment's about to be wrong but according to Wikipedia in the time that has elapsed since the events of Power Pack number one these characters have aged six years, at least normally aged six years. There is a reference to Alex over here having went into space and aged five years older than he should be. Um, I was confused at this. Again, the backstory tells you just enough to be confused. Um, and this is a reference to the ending of Secret Wars, the, the recent one that remade the Marvel Universe, and Jack went off with the Fantastic Four to help them uh, recreate and explore the new multiverse. Uh, and so that's, you know, when he aged five years. So how old should they be? According to Wikipedia, so during Hickman's run, Reed Richards said that Alex was 19 years old. So, since he's now five years older than he should be, he's 24. Um, now, in the normal flow of time, Julie here is two years younger, so she would be 17. Um, I don't really see that big a difference between them in appearance, but, you know, once you get a little older, it becomes hard to tell apart. So, Jack down here, he is two years younger than Julie, so he's 15. So I would say, you know, I have a hard time telling the age, age range between these two characters, but overall, this is, you know, how old they should be. But the problem is when we get to Katie, because Katie is three years younger than Jack. That makes Katie 12 years old. And we begin the issue of the new Power Pack number one with this crudely drawn 
uh, telling of the origin, there's a gag in here where she can't spell just basic words. She can't spell energy. And if you're saying, well, maybe Katie just isn't very good at, at spelling, according to Wikipedia, in the 2000 Power Pack miniseries, Katie actually skips two grades because she's so smart that she was able to skip ahead in school. So that seems unlikely that she wouldn't know how to spell energy. You might say that maybe uh, this is a gag about, you know, how you can't spell when you're handwriting something. You know, a gag about, you know, we're all so dependent on autocorrect on our phones or something. We, we can't remember how to spell basic words. Uh, but that's not really how this reads. This really reads like uh, something written by a child. All of Katie's dialogue feels like it's very childlike. Katie definitely feels like she's written, you know, more like, you know, what we're used to her as. She feels much younger than 12 years old. Um, so that was a little, you know, a little weird to me. But, you know, again, this is probably something Ryan North inherited from other portrayals of the character. And, you know, it, it's kind of in keeping with how characters age. Sometimes they age based on how the audience feels about them. If you're, you're infatuated with them being young and innocent and cute and all this stuff, they may age slower than the other characters that you're more anxious to see, you know, grow up and become Avengers or part of the Fantastic Four like Alex did. Um, these characters have had, you know, kind of a legacy of appearing in other titles. They've met all kinds of different characters, you know, X-Men and Wolverine. And uh, Alex was in Jonathan Hickman's run on uh, Fantastic Four. So there is a legacy there. You know, they've just, there's definitely a following for Power Pack, but it's still one of those weird series is that most people would not know what in the world a Power Pack is. So, that, you know, definitely some mixed feelings about how that first issue turned out, especially artistically and especially, you know, kind of orienting both new readers and guys who, like me, who do have some familiarity with it, but maybe don't have all their appearances, you know, because I wouldn't think most people would. And I'll say, don't go into this expecting Squirrel. This is not a brilliant, game-changing comic, but... It is a solid effort, you know, trying to play in other people's sandbox. And I think there's a lot of potential here. It's hard to recommend it just based on what the first issue has in it. But, you know, again, I think there's some real potential here. I'm definitely picking up the second issue and definitely interested in seeing where Ryan North takes this. So that's all my thoughts on uh, Power Pack Out Loud number one. Like and subscribe for more videos, and until next time, see ya.